Hey guys, and welcome to the fourth and final part of our four-part lecture series on River Valley Civilizations. This time we head to ancient River Valley Civilization in China. There's quite a few key concepts I want you guys to be aware of by the end of the presentation, so take some time to make note of those. Be especially aware of these comparison questions because they'll relate to the FRQ you guys have coming up soon. Some key vocab that uh, you won't find in the textbook is up here, feudal system and dynastic cycle. You might be wondering, why are we talking about the feudal system? Isn't that a medieval Europe sort of thing? Well, not just medieval Europe had something like the feudal system, and we'll talk about that as we get further into Shang Dynasty China. But it is something you want to be aware of, because there are comparisons that can be made between China thousands of years before the Common Era and Europe a thousand years after. This one is in the textbook, Mandate of Heaven, but I am going to describe it a little bit more in depth today, and you definitely, definitely want to be aware of this last term here and how it relates to the one above it, dynastic cycle. These two are super duper important. We are in chapter four of Spodek now, by the way. And like I said, we travel east to what is sometimes called the Yellow River Valley, but I'll show you in a second, it has other names, and it is in East Asia, modern day China. Okay, so like I said, we're talking about River Valley Civilization in China, and I like to start with this picture because it's actually a demonstration of one of those elements of civilization that settled people in River Valley China possessed, and that's writing, of course. You can probably tell based on the characters here that this is some form of writing. And unlike the Indus Valley people, we can translate the writing of the people who lived in China at this time. And interestingly enough, the earliest writing in China was most often used for a very different purpose than the earliest writing in, say, Mesopotamia or in Egypt. Um, instead of a lot of business records in trade and commerce and transaction records, we instead see these things called oracle bones. And they're called oracle bones because if you didn't know, an oracle is someone or something that can predict the future. And that's how most writing was used in ancient China. It was actually a question that was posed to the forces of nature. And it was written on bones, like this one. This happens to be the underside of a tortoise shell. And what the folks who wrote these messages would then do is they would heat the bones up, they would kind of poke them with a hot poker, and then depending on where and how they cracked, they would interpret those cracks through the questions as answers to their questions. That's why they're called oracle bones trying to predict the future by asking nature these questions and then having nature answer after the bones were broken. So a very interesting use for writing and one that tells us a little bit about the religions in these early river valley civilizations in China. But let's back up a little bit and start where we normally do, start with geography. Just like we compared the writing of River Valley Civilization in China 
to that of the Indus and to that of Mesopotamia. We can also compare their geography. And you'll see that like the Indus and like Mesopotamia, the Huanghe and Shenzhen rivers in China, they're also called the Yellow and the Yangtze respectively, were problematic. Most years they actually over flooded and could damage crops, could damage houses, could damage livestock, damage the society. If this sounds like some of the other River Valley civilizations that we've studied, uh, it should because there's a big time similarity there. Uh, here's one difference between at least Chinese civilization and Indus civilization. The Indus, they weren't really isolated from trade because they traded with the Mesopotamians. Um, the Chinese, unfortunately, were so far away and they were limited by the distance and by uh, transportation technology that they couldn't trade with anybody else. Um, but like the folks in Mesopotamia, unfortunately for the early Chinese, they were not isolated from unfriendly neighbors, neighbors who didn't want to trade but instead wanted to fight, wanted to take the riches of their civilization. I'm going to ask you this question right now, how could this difference in geography and similarities to earlier River Valley civilizations we've talked about, how could this impact the early Chinese society? I'm not going to answer that question right off the bat, but I'm going to kind of leave it to you guys to see if you can answer that as we go along here. What themes are we talking about here? Well, certainly theme one, right? That's humans' interaction with their environment. And whenever we talk about conflict, of course, that's going to be in theme three. Okay, so like other river valley civilizations, geography shaped the culture of the one in China. And also like other civilizations, part of that culture was having a central government. Now there is some serious debate among historians about who controlled the first central government. We call the folks who control the government in China, we call them a dynasty. And there's debate about whether the first group to control that government was a family known by the name of Xia, or whether it was a group called the Shang. It used to be that historians were almost totally convinced that the Shang was the first real dynasty in power in China, and the Xia was just this mythological story that was told and passed down to generation to generation that we really couldn't prove. Um, but the more archaeological finds historians are making, the more evidence we're digging up out of the dirt, the more artifacts we're finding that we think come from a sophisticated civilization older than the Sham. And more and more people are believing in the actual existence of the Xia. Unfortunately for the Xia, we don't really have a lot of writing from that time period in Chinese history, and you know how historians really like to study written records. So whether it existed or not, sadly for the Xia, we're going to go ahead and start with the Shang because they were the ones where all those oracle bones were found, and we have a more thorough written record about their existence. Okay, so let's talk about what life was like under the Shang Dynasty in China. Shang Dynasty, by the way, lasted from the 1600s to the 1000s BCE, give or take a couple years. There's two big things that I want you guys to remember about the Shang Dynasty. One is that they introduced the concept of respect for family and respect especially for elders into Chinese society. And by the way, that's a concept that is still very powerful in Chinese society today. So if you're asking that question, why do we care? Or why should we care? Um, 
you should know that that respect for elders in your family is still a really, really important um, aspect of life in China today. And it starts um, at least in the 1600s BCE with the Shang Dynasty. There is a connection, actually, to religion here. Why uh, elders were respected and revered so much. Because in Shang Dynasty religion, one of the notions was that any gods that may or may not exist out there um, didn't really have nearly as big of an impact on your family's fortune than the spirits of your ancestors did. And a lot of students, when I talk about spirits of their ancestors, all of a sudden shout, Oh, Mulan! It's Mulan! And Disney, you know, they get a lot of things wrong when they do their movies. But one thing they get right about uh, Chinese religious beliefs is that there's a belief that your ancestor spirit can have an impact on your fortunes while you are alive. And so pretty much the rule of thumb is, you know, don't tick grandma or grandpa off because once they're gone, their spirit can actually ruin your fortunes while you're still alive. So one of the reasons that elders were so respected by people at, at this time, and later on for that matter, is because during this time, the belief was that once those elders were gone, they were either going to help you or harm you in life. So you wanted to make sure that you respected them while they were alive. That's the connection between the respect for family elders, and Shang Dynasty religion. There's also something else that's really important about the Shang Dynasty, and that's the social hierarchy that they introduced, the social structure. Of course, we've talked about there being social class divisions in other societies, right? Mesopotamia had them, uh, Egypt had them, Indus were not so sure, but they may have had them. And here again, we see that same repetition. Right, that same pattern. So why are we stressing the social hierarchy in Shang Dynasty China so much? Well, because it's very comparable to a social hierarchy we're going to see somewhere else in a later period from history. And who you had on top was your emperor, the person in charge of basically running the government, um, running the dynasty. He delegated power to nobles. Uh, and these nobles were usually family connections, relatives of the emperor, who served the emperor in exchange for um, being granted large estates, cities to run, and the land around those cities to control. And then below the nobles you have these peasant farmers. And what the farmers do is they're granted the right to live on the land, which technically belongs to the nobles, and they are allowed to farm that land in exchange for a tax. They have to pay the nobles uh, a great deal of um, the products of their land, what they farm. They have to pay that to the nobles in exchange for the right to live on that land and be protected by the nobles who live, um, who live on it as well and really own it. And then, interestingly, a difference that's in China that separates it socially from the other civilizations we've talked about is where merchants come. Usually, you guys will remember, we see farmers on the bottom of the social pyramid. But merchants are actually on the bottom here, so keep that difference in mind, okay? What themes are we talking about here? We're talking about respect for elders, social hierarchy, religion, we see religion in theme two, right? Anything related to society, of course, is going to be theme five. So my question to you guys is, what does this social structure that we just talked about, what does it remind you of? I said it can be compared to something in a different place, a different time, right? And if you guys have a good memory from the beginning of the lecture, you'll know we're talking about the feudal system, right, in medieval Europe. I'll go back a couple slides. In the feudal system, if you just replace the word emperor with king, you pretty much have the same sort of system. The king grants land to nobles. Oftentimes those nobles were related to the king. 
and those nobles would be in charge of the land in exchange for their loyalty, their service to the king, and those nobles would in turn allow farmers, peasants, to live on that land, but the peasants, remember, had to pay the nobles a tax in the form of goods that they produced with that land. So very, very clear similarities between ancient China and medieval Europe here, even though they're in totally different time periods in totally different geographic locations. Keep that in mind. Okay, guys. So, remember when I said that this was the most important lecture so far? Well, this is the most important slide in the most important lecture so far. If you're not in the habit of taking lecture notes as you watch these things, you definitely need to, especially for this slide. I don't care whether you have a copy of this that you get the old-fashioned way, writing it down in a notebook, or whether you take a picture of it, or whether you take a screenshot and print it out, you should have a copy of this dynastic cycle somewhere in your possession, really at all times. So what is it, this dynastic cycle, and why the heck is it so important to AP world history anyway? Well, it's something that is actually introduced by the Zhou Dynasty when they overthrow the Shang Dynasty. The Zhou Dynasty, by the way, ruled from the 1000s to 200s BCE, give or take a couple years either way. And they had this idea about dynasties and the right that dynasties had to rule and when dynasties, if ever, should be overthrown. And that idea really centers around this term here called the mandate of heaven. So I'm going to start with this term, explain it first, and then kind of explain how it relates to the whole entire cycle. Okay? So let's start by breaking down this term. What is the mandate of heaven? Let's start with the term mandate. What is that all about? If you guys didn't know, uh, mandate's pretty much just a fancy term or fancy word that means stamp of approval. Okay? So to have a mandate to rule is basically to have a stamp of approval. And in our society today, uh, that stamp of approval, we believe, comes from the people, right? That's how a democracy works. You get a mandate from the people. You might have heard that term before. But this isn't about a mandate from the people. It's about a mandate of heaven, right? So what does heaven mean? You guys might pretty much be certain that you have this term figured out already, especially if you believe in the existence of such a thing. But we're not talking about heaven in the more commonly understood or traditional sense here. Here heaven actually means something totally different and the Zhou defined heaven as the forces of nature. The forces of nature. So that's a very different uh, explanation of that term probably than what most of you guys are used to. But it's important to know that in this case heaven really means the forces of nature, not anything related to any kind of afterlife that any of you guys might be familiar with. Okay, So, broken down, the mandate of heaven really means stamp of approval from the forces of nature. Remember that because it's going to be really important in a second. So the, the, the Zhou believed that a dynasty, if it was supposed to rule, had this stamp of approval from the forces of nature. How did you get that approval from nature? Well, you did all the things over here under the new dynasty section. You established peace and you built good infrastructure. Remember, infrastructure is going to be your roads, your canals. In this case, uh, 
a system of dams that prevented the rivers from over flooding and ruining your crops and washing away your livestock and your houses and all that stuff. Um, also, you gave land to the peasants, um, distributed it evenly, equally, so that people could have an equal chance and success in farming. And you also protected people, made sure that they were free from invaders from outside your empire or from uh, thieves or bandits inside your empire. That was all the, uh, those were all the things that you did as a good dynasty that had earned the stamp of approval from the forces of nature. So the Joe said, if you did these things, great, you deserve to rule, excellent. But what if you didn't do these things? What if you started doing the opposite things? like treating people unfairly, right, by maybe taxing them too much, uh, by not protecting them, by uh, refusing or being unsuccessful in keeping up your infrastructure, letting it decay, you know, your roads start to get potholes or your dams start to break and all of a sudden there's flooding and there's problems with your agriculture, right? If this sort of stuff started to happen, the Joe believed, you would lose the mandate of heaven. You would lose that approval from the forces of nature. And moreover, nature would show you it was upset. It would show you that it had a problem with your leadership. And there would be floods and other natural disasters like earthquakes, um, landslides, terrible things. And this was nature's way, the Joe said, of showing the society that the people leading it, the dynasty in charge, had no more stamp of approval from nature. And when these things started to happen, the floods, the earthquakes, the natural disasters, things started to really fall apart, right? Agriculture suffers, so peasants start to revolt. Invaders start to enter your empire because they sense weakness. They say, oh my goodness, look, this empire can no longer support itself with its agriculture. It must be weak now. I, I can invade and take all their good stuff. Bandits within the empire start to raid the countryside and steal from other people because the laws can no longer be enforced. So all these things are signs that the dynasty has lost the mandate of heaven. It's at that point that a new dynasty says, you know what, um, the old dynasty no longer has the right to rule. Instead, we have the right to rule. We have the stamp of approval from the forces of nature. We have the mandate of heaven, and they successfully come to power, and then they reestablish the peace. They rebuild the infrastructure. They start giving land back to the peasants, and they protect people once again. And then they'll continue to rule with the mandate of heaven until they stop doing that stuff and become much like the old dynasty before them. And then the cycle repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats again and again and again and again and again for over 2,000 years of Chinese history. Okay, that's why this is so important. Because you might forget a little something about each and every one of those individual dynasties that we'll learn about. But if an FRQ or multiple choice question asks you how did one dynasty lose power? How did the next regain power. You can bet it has something to do with this cycle. It lasts from the earliest dynasties, from the Xia all the way through the Shang and Zhou, and all the way up until 1911 when the last dynasty, the Qing, falls. So this is really important for you guys to be aware of. If you're still struggling with the concept of the mandate of heaven, what exactly does it mean? I like to put it in Star Wars terms for anybody who's familiar with the Star Wars movies. I kind of think of the mandate of heaven as like having the force, right? In actuality, it's the forces of nature, but think of it like Star Wars, right? If you're just, if you're good, if you're kind, if you're ruling in the right way, the force is with you, right? You can use the force to control your society. But what if you go to the dark side, right? What if you all of a sudden stop doing those good things? Well, then the force is no longer with you, 
right? And a new dynasty can say the force is instead with us, and they can use that to uh, reestablish a good dynasty. So if you're having trouble, like I said, with the Mandate of Heaven, just think Star Wars, just think use the force. You can pretty much understand the reasons for change in government. Okay, so why do we care about the Mandate of Heaven? Well, hopefully I just did a good enough job of explaining why you should care for the AP exam. Why did it matter to China? Well, if you were in power as a dynasty and you believed in the Mandate of Heaven, you didn't want to lose it, right? So you'd try to continue doing those good things for your people as long as possible and maintaining stability. And typically in China we see very long dynasties for that reason. And those long dynasties meant longer periods of peace, longer periods of stability. And that meant better opportunities for trade, for commerce within the society. Better opportunities later on once China is connected to the rest of the world for trade and commerce elsewhere. And of course that connects to your economy if you're talking world history themes. And also uh, it allowed for advances in technology. If you're not worried about natural disasters, if you're not worried about bandits, if you're not worried about invaders, um, you can be more productive in your inventing or whatever else it is you're doing. And um, we see for this reason some of the best technology come out of China um, in the earlier parts of history and we see some of the strongest economies run by Chinese dynasties for that reason so do keep that in mind okay guys you know the drill uh, characteristics of civilizations how well does ancient China fit into these based on what you've read based on what we've been talking about here. Just like with the other civilizations, we'll eventually have a discussion about this when we return to class. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.